and uh, bring you the message. I hope the Lord will use it to speak to your heart. Don't forget tonight, 6 o'clock, come praying. Bring your Bible. You're going to need it. Bring your pen and take some notes. And you will never be as confused in Leviticus from now on uh, if you'll come tonight in the services. Some, sometimes some of those Old Testament stuff seem like just pure ritual and what's the point and all this. But uh, Jesus told his disciples one time, he said, uh, search the scriptures. For they are they that testify of me. And if you look, all that Old Testament stuff points to the Lord Jesus Christ. So to, uh, don't forget that tonight, 6 o'clock. Psalm 104, I want to read a verse of scripture here. Verse number 1, and give you a thought this morning that you already know, but I want to uh, just you know, nail it down once in a while. Uh, you got to, if you got a deck... Any of you men, if you got an outside deck, you know what I mean. Wood. Um, you got this deck, and it's all pretty made out of salt treated wood. And uh, all summer, the sun shines on it, and it rains. Sun shines, sun shines. Sometimes them boards try to warp and bend, and you'll see one of them sticking up like that. And now, and you have to take a hammer and go bam, and that put it back in its place. And that's what we do with preaching. Sometimes you have to just walk around one time and some nail some of this stuff down tight. Uh, that's already there. So that's what I'll do this morning. Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. What about that? who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who makes his angel spirit and his ministers a flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Think about that. God laid the foundations of this earth. Scientists have never been able to figure that out. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment, that the water. And the water stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. And the voice of thy thunder that hasted away. And then it goes on and on and on and on and on, on and down through there. But I want to look back at verse number one this morning where he said, Lord, thou art very great. I want to preach for a few minutes this morning on this subject. How great is our God? Uh, not to quote that temporary song, that is a scriptural concept. How great is our God? He's very great. When we were little, all of us learned that prayer. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him. Remember that? And we had no idea. I had no idea how great God was when I was a little kid praying that prayer. But I sure have learned a lot since then uh god is great many times people say boy you should go there that's a great restaurant or you should go there that's a great view on this mountain or you should go there that's a great place to buy grocery and when you go it ain't as great as they made it sound out to be but when you talk about god being great brother you cannot disappoint he'll never disappoint you no matter how big you describe him he's even bigger than that he's bigger than, we learn in ephesians on wednesday night He's exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. So let's talk about how great God is this morning. Here's your here's one thing about. First, you think about this. God is great enough to create out of nothing the heavens and the earth. Now, we've heard that all of our life. But think about that for a second. Think about there was nothing but God. And then God said, let there be light. And God said, uh, it, it created the heavens and the earth. He did all of that with a spoken word. God created it. In Psalm 33 and verse 6, it said, by the word of the Lord. You know, that is Jesus. God made it by Jesus. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And then the Bible says, that, uh, that, that God, in Ephesians 3, 9, New Testament, that God created all things by Jesus Christ. What it says. And God did it in the beginning. He created everything. 
there's a little uh, a joke said uh, one time these scientists were all were all trying to uh, invent the world's greatest computer and the world's greatest computer was real big and it filled this room up you know and it, it was all and the and all the scientists in the world were gathered together and they said this is it it has the answer to past, present, and future. This computer knows everything. And what will be the question that the great scientist of the world will ask the great computer? And of course they said, "Where? how did the world get here? And they put that question in the great computer. And they put that thing in there. How did the world get here? They said all of a sudden the, the big computer began to shake. It, it shook a little bit. Smoke started coming out one side of it. Uh, you heard noise. Zzz, 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 like it was shortening in, shortening out. And then all of a sudden it spit out the answer. And all the world waited and all the cameras turned and it said, see Genesis 1-1. That's how I got here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I got thinking about that sometime. You know, uh, you know uh, the, the world is a big place, y'all. It's a mighty big place. When you go up in an airplane and fly five or six hundred miles an hour and it, it takes you four hours or three, three to get to California that's just the United States and you look at the United States on a map I think the United States only covers like two or three percent of the mass the surface of the earth and it takes four hours going 600 miles an hour uh, just to go that, that little place. That's why. That's why I don't worry about polluting the world. And China's crazy, and China's wicked, and our government's full of the devil, telling us that uh, y'all supposed to quit driving cars. We're supposed to shut our plants down because of pollution. Two percent of the surface of the earth ain't gonna pollute the whole environment around the whole world. That's a bunch of bull. All this environmental stuff is is a tool they're using to try to everything to shut us down, so the government can run on everybody. That's all that is little uh, uh, left-wing political pipe and smoke it and, and jump in the lake with it too, brother. Uh, listen, you you couldn't, know, you couldn't pollute the environment if you tried. Now, I know I know they dirty smoke, stuff like that, but God's got that all figured out. But anyway, God made the earth. Sometimes when I go through the mountains and you go across that, that gorge over there from Asheville to Knoxville, um, I, I drove Interstate 40 uh, from Los Angeles to, to, to here. And from here down to wherever it ends, down yonder in Raleigh or somewhere. And I drove that whole interstate. And the, uh, the scariest interstate road you ever been on your life is between Asheville and, uh, and Knoxville. I'm telling you, brother, it's like this. It's curved. And everybody's flying. There's a brick wall on one side and rocks on the other. And tractor and trailer right in here like that. And they ain't nowhere to go. And every time I go over there, every time I drive that way, I'm looking at them rocks. And I'm looking at them big old rocks. They big old rocks bigger than this church building. And I look at them and think, what in how in the world? I would have loved to seen that get pushed up there like that. It wasn't always like that. God didn't make it all jagged and all tore all to pieces. There's been catastrophic judgments on this earth. And uh, there's, we'll talk about some other time. Uh, the flood and some other things where the fountains of the great deep opened up. And that's why mountains are near the coast. You know, that mountain over here on the coast. Mountains over here, and it's so flat right now. When that flood came, that pushed that stuff up and pushed up the coastline and made the mountains. And put anyway, he made them. And then I got to wondering how much rock as big as this church weighed. And then I got to thinking, how much would the earth weigh? The whole earth, how much would it weigh? Somebody figured it up. And oh my goodness, there's some astronomical trillion, trillion, trillion times, so many trillion tons. But there, there's no way to weigh it because it ain't, it ain't nothing, ain't nothing under it. The, and there's, uh, there's no way to weigh it because it's, if it's round like this, this rock over here is pulled this way, and this rock over here is pulled this way, and gravity, whatever that is, is pulling them both down. Now gravity's real. Ain't no doubt about it. I can prove it. Watch. I'm trying to go into outer space. See, I can't. I ain't a space jam. And I, you can only go so high. Uh, gravity pulled me back down just now. He pulled And scientists don't know what gravity is. There's a question for it. Let me tell you what the Bible said. The Bible said he made the world and hung it. God just hung it out there and said, stay 
right there. And they try to explain it. Bless their heart. I feel so sorry for them. Uh, the, them poor old scientists, they sit and rack their brain and they try to say this portion and the, the sun split out and the, and the planets came out and they were all spinning and, and the gravitation of the sun holds the earth in place and the gravitation of the, of the world holds the moon in place and the moon's gravitation pulls and we have a high tide and a low tide. <laughs> they drive their self crazy. Trying to do that. You know what the Bible said? God said he made a, run, a line that the ocean could come that far and no further. He made it so the waves can all come in. It's a whole lot more sense just to believe God did it. And playing everything by religion. It's just religion. Religion. No, no. We're talking science. We're talking science. Just because real science supports the Bible and vice versa don't mean we're trying to make it religious. You know, the biggest, dumbest, ridiculous religion in the world is evolution. And there is atheism. There is no God. That's the dumbest religion I've ever heard of in my life. You know, if there's no God, everything come out of nowhere by itself. And there wasn't nothing and there's everything. And there's air. Where did air come from? Where did water come from? Where did rocks come from? They couldn't have just evolved. You know what they believe? They believe that for millions and millions and millions and millions of years, it rained upon rock. They don't know where the rain come from or the rock. And it rained on this rock and made this primordial soup. And all of a sudden, one day, these chemical acids got together and made something come alive. And it must have made something else come alive because they had to find somebody to marry. And they've had kids and they had kids and then, and here we are. Air evolved. You know what's evolved right now? It's thought. You know what I'm preaching? You're thinking about what I'm saying. I, some of you are thinking. Sometimes I don't know. I don't know if some of you got evolved with a brain or not. I don't mean that bad, but uh, evidently, uh, it, it's wrong. Uh, but uh, you know, you're you're thinking. I'm I'm able to think. I'm able to think about. There's my Bible. There's my there's this. Uh, that where did thought come from? If, if where did thought the ability to think come from it's ridiculous I'll tell you what it is how great is our God brother how great is our God you know what the Bible said God made this world and God made a garden and he put a man and a woman in it and they fell and that's why all the problems that's why all the sin that's why we have hospitals that's why we have that's why we have funeral homes. That's why we have emergency rooms. That's why we have people crying. That's why we have people dying. It all makes sense when you realize that God did it all just like the Bible said. I love that story. You heard me tell. I just love that story. Said a, a woman been telling her little boy Bible stories. And she'd been telling Bible stories, Bible stories. And so one day she, he went to bed. And she's sitting downstairs reading. And her little boy, about five years old, six, he said, Mama, Mama, is all them stories in the real Bible really true? She said, Yes, you go to bed and go to sleep right now. He come back in about five minutes. He said, Mama, Mama, is all them stories in the Bible really, really true? She said, Yes, you get in the bed right now. Come up there and wear you out. He come back in a minute. He said, Mama, is that story you told me true about we come from dust? We're going back to that. She said, yes, what in the world wrong with you? He said, Mama, get up here right now. There's somebody under my bed coming or going one. I don't know which it is. And you know, that, that little boy, he had it figured out. And that's what the Bible said. God said he made us out of dust. God said he made us out of dust. You can take your hand right there and wipe dust off of that pulpit. That's what we're made out of. And the Bible said God created man. Amen. You say, well, I know a man. He said he didn't know if he was a God or not. You know why an atheist can't find God? For the same reason, a thief can't find a policeman. He ain't looking for it. Uh, he's going the other way, hoping there ain't no God, brother. That's right. He's great enough to, to, to create heaven and earth. They said one of them astronauts, Russian astronauts, went up there and circled the earth a few times, you know, went in orbit uh, two or three times. And he said, well, I, I ain't no God. I went up there and I didn't, I didn't see God. I went around the world five times, didn't see no God. And somebody said, jump out of that thing if you don't find out there's a God. <laughs> He'll find out there's a God. Uh, I'll guarantee it. He's great enough to create heaven and earth. But let me say secondly this morning, hey, listen, God is great enough to answer our prayers. I'm glad we're not wasting our breath or energy when we pray. God answers prayer. He sure does. He sure does. Uh, years ago, as a matter of fact, it was April 14th, 1912. A man by the name of Archibald Gracie got up on a big old ship. He was a very important man. 
His wife was at home in New York City where that they stayed. He was on the ship, the ill-fitted Titanic. And that evening, uh, before he went to his bed and retired in his room, Mr. Gracie took a, a like what we would call a hot tub. On the Titanic, they had uh, about a six-foot tub, and it was heated salt water. And you could actually get in there and relax, and it was warm. And, and uh, he said he said never enjoyed a, a bath any more than he did that one. And so he did that that night and went to bed to lay down to sleep. He had slept only a few minutes when all of a sudden he felt a shock, heard a loud noise, and the crew members were beating on his doors saying the ship struck an iceberg and were going down. He jumped up, got dressed, come up on the deck, and you know the rest of the story. He fought that night and fought that night and fought that night. Meanwhile, at home, no cell phone, no way to contact each other, his wife woke up and had a strange burden to pray. She got down on her knees beside her bed and started saying, God, I don't know what's wrong, but please take care of him. Please take care of my husband. And prayed and prayed. Back on the ship now. He, he's on there and he's getting women and children loaded on the lifeboats. And he knew. He said, this is it. I'm going down. And he, he got to thinking. He thought, well, I, I, I love you, honey. I'll never see you again. And he's mine, but I'll never get to tell her this. And so he, he said they were going down and the ship started going down. And he said, when that thing went down, he went down in the water and he had read stories about big old ships like that sinking. And he said, sometimes them boilers, you know, you've seen them great, big, Lord, them things, big, big as high fist building right here, big old circle boilers. He said they would explode under the water to water up so it would it would it'd burn you to death. The water would be so hot, it'd boil you, it'd boil it. And he said when he's swimming in that water, he could just feel one of them things blowing up and, and just burning him to death in that icy water. And he said he started swimming just as hard as he could. And he said he tried not to let no that get in his mouth. And he kept swimming and kept swimming. And he went under. And he said he looked up and right through some of the water, he could see the stars. And he said if I could just get up. And he come up out of the water and grabbed a hold of a piece of a, of a ship. And he said when he did, there was a lifeboat over there that was turned upside down that had capsized, and there's a bunch of guys sitting on top of it. And he said, none of them offered him a hand. Nobody tried to help him. He said, I guess they figured they can't get nobody else on there. He said, I went over there, and I grabbed a hold of one of them guys' arms like that. He said, I took one leg and tried to put it up on that boat. And he said, it wasn't long. About 5 o'clock that morning, a rescue ship came by and picked them up. Back in New York City, his wife was praying, and she told it later. She didn't know it. She didn't even know the boat went down until the next morning. And she said, at 5 o'clock in the morning, the burden lifted from her. And she said, okay, everything's all right, and went back to sleep. In a few hours, her sister came and knocked on their apartment door with the New York Times saying the Titanic had gone down. And, of course, she was all two pieces. And he told later on in his testimony, he said, that's the most incredible announcement of answer prayer, you can't figure that out. Uh, the world has no answer for that. She got peace right at the time. Now, uh, let me tell you something, people. Our God still can answer prayer. He's great enough to answer your prayer. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how bad the mess is at your house. I, you may be sitting here this morning being abused. You may be in some kind of perverted relationship. You may be in some kind of uh, financial mess. You you may be afraid the law, somebody's going to come and arrest you. You may think, Lord, my life's going to hell. What's going to happen to you? I'm telling you this morning there is still God in heaven that can hear and answer prayers and God is great enough to answer mine and your prayers this morning you say well he can do that but he can't do this yes he can he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask him. we need to hear that once in a while we need to hammer that and down real good because the devil will make you think well we're living in 2023 people don't believe like that no more it can't happen no yes sir. listen that listen god's got a monkey wrench that'll fit any nut in burke county that's right brother ain't nothing ain't too high it ain't too wide it ain't too low it ain't too deep it's not too hard it's not too difficult for god he specializes in things impossible and he's able to do what you want him to do today god is great enough answer prayer let me say 
Thirdly, quickly this morning, God's great enough to write a perfect book. If He's God, He's able, he's able to communicate. And you know what He said? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word, that's a strange thing to call your manifestation of your Son, a Word. Capital W. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus was God in flesh. He was God in flesh. They're one, not two, not three. They're not three different gods. They're one God manifest in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he said in the beginning was the Word. God communi- He chose to communicate with his creation by words. And we have them here in the Bible. You know, he's able to present. He said in Psalm 12, thou shalt keep them. Oh, Lord, thou shalt preserve them. You know, the Lord preserves preaching. He preserved, he preserved all them great men of God's preaching in reserve so we can read it. He does that with tapes and see it years ago. Years ago, there's a guy came, called me one day. Uh, oh, Lord, it's been 25 years ago. He said, Any castle? I said, yes, sir, it sure is. He said, I just want to thank you for something. Said, he said, I live in Spruce Pine. And he said, I'd really, really, really been going through a hard time battling about this Bible version thing. He said the pastor at my church, got a good church, got a good pastor. But he said he'd been using a, a new modern version of the Bible and using the NIV and using different versions of the Bible. And he said, in my heart, I knew something wasn't right about that. And he said, God, help me, show me what's right. He said, I knew how I felt, but I didn't know why. I said, I didn't want to question my pastor or I didn't want to, I didn't want to put a... a like make him think I was disrespecting him or doubting him. But he said, something just didn't feel right about that. And he said, I prayed. He said, I prayed. And I said, God, please show me the truth. And not too long before that, I'd preached a sermon on the subject, don't let them get your Bible. They made fun of me down in Pensacola of that because they, 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 they said I pronounced it, don't let them get G-I-T-Y-E-R B-I-B-U-L. Don't let them get your Bible. And they laughed at me. They said, that's the way you say it. And I'm, well, whatever. Long you know what I'm talking about. Don't let them get your Bible. And I didn't say get your Bible. I said, get your Bible. Get you. Do you not understand? Get you. What country are you from? Don't let them get your Bible, brother. Amen. That means get your. Duh. We're in the South. They ain't no use saying all them syllables. It'd take me three hours to preach. You chop it off on both sides and say the middle of it. Like Jeet and Jew, you know. Jeet and Jew. Somebody said Jeet? No, Jew. Like that, see. Uh, it, it's, we say the middle. Well, anyway, they said, don't let them get your Bible. What kind of sermon is that? Well, anyway, he said, I got that tape. And he said, it helped me, Brother Danny. It straightened me out. Thank you. Thank you. And I said, I said wow, well, who gave that to you? He said, I was at the dumpster. He said, I took trash to the dumpster. And that back, everybody looks at cassette tapes. That's before everybody looks at CDs. He said, I was putting in the trash, and I looked in the dumpster, and there was that tape. He said, honest before the Lord, I looked in there, and there was that tape. He said, I'm going to get that. I want you to buy with Danny Castle. Huh? He said, I put it in it straightened me out. He said, God did that. God let me find that. And I said, whoo. Y'all know, you know what I think. It's called mixed emotions. It's, it's the feeling you get when your mother-in-law drives your new Cadillac off a cliff. It, yeah, I thought, glory to God. Somebody threw my tape in the dumpster. Boy, that's what they think about my hard work and study. And pre- but anyway, we rejoiced, and I had a good time, and I got to thinking, you know what the Lord will do? i tell you what the Lord will do. The Lord will give you the truth if you want it. Our problem is getting to where we want it. You do, you do this. You get down on your knees and say, God, no bias, no preconceived stuff. Like I was preaching last Sunday night about the will of God. You show me what's right. and He'll do it. He'll do it. Amen. He's great enough. Quickly. Third, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. Listen to this. He's great enough to write a perfect book. He's great enough to make the whole world. He's great enough to answer prayer. Number four, he's great enough to save any sinner. 
He can save any sinner, brother. I'm telling you from the uttermost to the guttermost, uttermost. I mean, he can take you out of the mire and put you in the choir, brother. I'm telling you, brother, uh, the church can't, the ordinances can't, the membership can't, the baptistry can't, but the Lord can. Amen. He sure can. He can and he will. He will. Uh, you come to just as I am without one plea. I don't care how bad your life's messed up this morning. If you're not saved, if you're here this morning, you're not saved, you're watching from on home and, and uh, you're in the bedroom and your parents are in there watching me on TV and you can hear what I'm saying, this is for you. Uh, maybe you're sitting in there eating a bowl of cereal and your family's in the living room watching this this morning, this is for you. He's able to say, He's able to save to the uttermost. To save to the uttermost. I remember hearing, uh, reading about uh, uh, Vance Habner. Uh, Vance Habner was a great, great preacher for many years. And uh, he said that many college professors are searching for wisdom and truth and reality while the janitors that clean their offices are happy and know exactly what life's all about and have more fun and joy than they do. And he said that's true. And he said, there's a man by the name of Alexander Grigioli. And he said that was some kind of an Italian name, Grigioli. And he said he came to America from the, uh, over there to study in the early 20th century. This guy was brilliant. He earned three different doctor's degrees and became a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. But he's miserable. He's miserable. Uh, he said it's empty on the inside. He said, I couldn't, I, I, something like that, three earned doctor's degree, making a ton of money, something wasn't there on the inside. And back then, they had what they called shoe shine. Boy, you go somewhere and get a shoe shine. You, they used to be out on the street, you see them in the airport, where, uh, you know, the, the big shop businessman goes and puts your foot on this, and a guy shines your shoes, and you give him, give him some money. And he said, he got, went and got a shoe shine reading the paper. And he said, the boy, every time he'd do it, that boy was laughing and joking and having the best time ever was. And one day, he put his newspaper down. And he said, why are you always so happy? And he said, that boy looked back at him. And he said, because Jesus saved me. And he said, God loves me. And Jesus cared about me enough so God can forgive all my sins. That's why I'm happy. And he said, he got mad jerked that paper back in front of me, something like that right there. Uh, but he said he couldn't get away from that. He went home and thought about it. He went back to work and thought about it. It's like a little conviction dagger stuck him in the heart. That's why you should always not be ashamed to tell somebody what the Lord's done for you. He said a dagger stuck in him. And he said he couldn't get away from him. Finally, he said, I, finally he said, I, just can't, I went to church and got saved. He went and got saved and got a job at Wheaton College teaching anthropology to students, and he had a student in his class that he greatly influenced, a young man named Billy Graham. And that guy influenced him all because that shoe shine boy said, Jesus saved me. He wasn't a Bible scholar. He probably didn't even know any doctrine. Jesus saved me. Let me tell you something, brother. If God can do that, for a brilliant scientist with three earned doctor's degree, he's great enough to save your daddy or your brother or your husband or your son or your daughter. I'm telling you, he's great enough to save anybody. i tell you a story I read, and I don't even know if I believe this, but I'm just going to tell it to you. I read it in a Christian book, missionary story. Some strange things happen on the mission field. This In Africa, a lady was a Christian. Her husband hated God, hated church, hated everything about it. And she had by her side a loyal dog. And her and her dog went in one of those big old open air like a tabernacle. And she said every Sunday that woman went to church and she sat on the edge of the dog would go with her to the altar. Pray right like kneel down and pray right beside her. And she said it done every week. And so that dog was just one of them stories, you know, with a loyal dog loving his master. And that, that dog stayed right with her. And finally, she died. And she, when she died, they, that, her husband, mean as a devil, beat her and everything, mocked her for going to church, said he noticed that that dog would take off on Sunday morning and get gone and come back about two hours later. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Dog knows the days of the week. You, you hear some mighty strange stories about the amazing ability that some, some dogs can get sometimes. That dog went to church every Sunday. 
And he said, I'm just going to go see what he's doing. Went and sat in the back, and that dog sat right over there where she sat. Lo and behold, preacher gave the invitation, dog come. And gets down to all of them. I don't know if that's true or not. But I'm telling you, that's why I, in a missionary, I can show you the story. Some, God lets some strange things happen on the mission field sometimes. And lo, and he got under conviction. Long story short, he got saved. I'd, I'd hate for y'all sit there and think a dog's a better soul winner than I am. But that dog led that guy to the Lord. I'm telling you, he can use a rooster. Get a hold of Peter. He can use a, a, a Balaam's ass to talk to him. He can use a, a fish to speak to him. Hey, listen, the Lord is great enough. Listen, you pray. If your husband's not saved, Here's what I pray for him. God, give him scary dreams. Let him, let him dream Jason coming after him. I'm going to throw him in hell. Really? Really? Hey, the Lord can use some unconventional ways to get a hold of people's heart. He's great enough to save any sinner. My, my, my. Years ago, there was a powerful evangelist in this country. In the 19th century, his name was Uncle. They called him Uncle John Vaser. John Vaser grew up, listen to me, in a family brewery in New York that made their whole family made their money off liquor. He got saved in 1850 and took off across the country and left that stuff. Listen, if you're in an alcohol business, when you really get saved, you leave that stuff behind. You leave it alone. Alcohol has no place in the life of a Christian. None. As a beverage. Well, he left it. He went across the country selling Christian literature and witnessing to everybody. He went to a woman's house one time and she begged for a Bible. And it was back in the country. They didn't, nobody had much. And he gave her one. Her husband was wicked and mean. Didn't want his wife getting right with God. And he took that Bible and chopped it in two with an axe. And he said he chopped that Bible in two with an axe. He said, here. We, we half everything in our marriage. There's your half. Threw his out in the shed. She kept praying. Kept praying. She kept praying. And one day, it was cold and rainy, and he couldn't work. And he, sat, and he, he went out in the shed, and he just fooled around, sat around out there, and he picked up that half a Bible that was his. And it was over in Luke 15, where he, the prodigal son. And he started reading that story. A certain man had two sons. And the young of them said, Father, give me the portion of the goods that follows to me. And took his substance into the far country and wasted his substance with righteous living. There arose a mighty famine in the land, you know, on down through there. And it, and it cut out halfway through the story. She had the other half. And it got his attention. And he said, man, what happened? What happened? And it got to bother him so bad. He said, let me see your half of that. And he read the rest of the story. And gave his life to the Lord. Because that woman kept praying. I'm telling you this morning. God is great enough. To save any sinner. And forgive you this morning. Are you here this morning and you say preacher I've done so much wrong. God can. Yes he can. Yes he can and he will. If you'll come this morning. And you'll say Lord. Lord. I've been wrong. I want to be saved. You'll do that more to save you. If you're here this morning, you got a loved one, or somebody in your family, or maybe a situation. I'm telling you, God's great. Let's stand and sing. Let's stand and sing, or let's stand and pray first. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Miss Desi's coming quickly. Maybe you're here this morning. You say, Brother Danny, her situation in my life. That I really, really, really need to pray about. And I know God's great. And I'm going to come and put it in His hands. Once again, ask Him to help me. Something's already coming. You want to just slide out of your seat? Come on down here and let's get down on our knees. Let's get down on our knees. And let's ask the Lord to work it out. If you'll keep praying, keep praying. This is the invitation. We're not going to sing. We're just going to wait. Just a few, just few seconds. Come on. Amen. 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 That's right. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. 
People are praying all over the building this morning. Will you let God speak to your heart? Will you? Will you let God speak to your heart? Oh, God. Oh, God, I pray. Help us, Lord. Maybe you're here this morning you've never been saved. You've never really, really, really been saved. You want to come? Come on, ma'am. Come on, sir. Just get down on your knees. We'll show you. Somebody take the Bible. Show you exactly what you've got to do to get saved. You want to get saved? Come on. You want to know you're saved? You want to know you're going to heaven when you die? Come on. Come on right now. Come on right now. Amen. Come on. Come on. Come on, young people. Maybe you can come on the bus. Maybe you've never been here before. If it's your first time. I don't know. You come right now. Come on. Come on right now. Come on right now. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You put it in the Savior's hands. Oh, God, you know we all got burdens. We all got stuff in our heart and life. Lord, that ain't, ain't possible for us to fix. I pray, God, your will will be done. Lord, help us, Lord. Lord, you know who we're praying for. You know who we're, we're asking you to touch and convict. Lord, I know you're able to do it. I pray the Holy Ghost to come down and do a work in the hearts and life. Lord, there's people here this morning got financial trouble, got physical trouble. Uh, Brother Rowan down there in Florida, I pray that you help him and touch him. God, help, Lord. Oh, God, please, Lord. Please, Lord Jesus. Touch him, Father, I pray. Have your way, Lord God. Do what ought to be done. Move in every heart and every life. Help us, O oh Lord, we ask. God, I pray you'd save souls right here this morning, Lord. Those that are watching from home and online, touch them, Father. Have your way in our hearts today. God, move in great power. Lord, hallelujah. We'll thank you for it. But we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake, we do pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Get it right? You get it right? All right. Thank you. God bless you. All right. All right. Before you go now, don't miss tonight. Bring your Bibles. Bring your pens. Uh, you will learn something tonight that will help you understand your Old Testament better than you ever have before. I promise you. Don't miss tonight. Now, uh, Brother Kevin's right over here. He just lost his mother. So y'all be sure to raise your hand over our Brother Kevin. And everybody, y'all be sure and uh, give him words of comfort and everything. They'll be receiving friends for her uh, Friday evening at five uh, 4 o'clock over here at uh, Heritage Funeral Home in Valdez, right on Highway 70 over there on the hill. So uh, don't forget that. Then don't forget our cookout. Cookout's one week from tomorrow on Memorial Day. Uh, bring bring whatever you want to bring. I think the ladies bring chili and, and uh, desserts, cupcakes, cake, whatever. Uh, we'll have the grills ready. We'll have uh, drinks and we'll have uh, uh, hamburgers and hot dogs. If you want steak or ribs or whatever, feel bring it or bring some extra hamburger. I think I think we might have enough for everybody one, but uh, if we don't, bring some anyway uh, for your family and, and we'll have a big time. Five thirty, I got here in the parking lot. Okay, now we also I'd like to know about the CDL license. Who's all going to do it? I know there's five or six of us. And I'd also want to know if you're planning on riding the bus, riding the bus this Friday. So when you go out this morning, uh, let me know. All right, Lucas, come on up here. I want you to dismiss us. Glad to have these gentlemen in here from uh, uh, Knoxville again. Let me on here. And they're just, uh, they're down here this weekend on a drug deal or something. Uh, so uh, he'll say something and introduce your buddy here. And uh, he'll dismiss us more to prayer. Don't miss tonight. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Brother Danny. Uh, this is my friend Xander. We're from Knoxville, Tennessee. Most of y'all already know me. Uh, we come up here every now and again just because we love this church. We love Brother Danny. Um, all, most of my family got saved at youth rally, so it's a big part of my life spiritually. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful for Brother Danny and his family and everything this church has done for us. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for another day of life. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and hear and to worship and to pray and, and to hear the preaching of your word, God. I thank you, pray that we would take it, not just take it in one ear and out the other, but to apply it to our lives and go out there and win souls for you, God, because that is the ultimate goal is to glorify you and to win souls, Lord. I pray that you keep us safe as we travel back home. Keep everyone safe as they come back tonight. 
in your sons perfect and precious name I pray. Amen.